using the word as synonymous in his parable with the idea of seeds to sow, to grow in the soil. The word is the word of God, as we call it today, the Bible. But you also know that the Bible says in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Jesus Christ is the word of God. Now the word has power unlike anything else in this entire world. You and I may be able to change some things in our lives. And all of us have tried at times to change and to do better and to kind of reform ourselves. But the Word of God can transform us, change us from the inside out. For no matter how well you can change your circumstances and change whatever's happening in your life, you cannot save yourself, nor can I save myself. I had to receive it as a free gift from God and allow God through the Holy Spirit to transform me from the inside out. And Jesus says the seed is the word. So as a pastor, I'm not supposed to be sowing my opinions. My opinions are no better or worse than anyone else's. I'm supposed to be sowing the word. And you and I, are supposed to be sowing the word. And then he talks about there are different levels of receptivity. Some, he says, people in verse 15, are like seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes the word that was sown in their lives. Others, like seed sown on rocky places, hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time, and when trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Still others, like seeds sown among thorns, hear the word, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires of other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Others, like seed sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop 30, 60, or even a hundred times what was sown. Notice you have to receive the word and accept it. Accept doesn't mean, well, I just have to accept it. Accept means it's true. I've taken it into my life and I'm going to pattern everything in my life on the word. And Jesus is saying, if the word is alive in your life, it will produce life, it will produce results in your life all out of proportion to what you and I could do by ourselves. Now, do you believe that? Well, I don't really know if I, I, I do care if you believe it, but I, if it's between your opinion and the Word of God, I have to let you know I'll take the Bible every time it has a much better track record than any of us. The Bible says that's what happens. And then he goes on to say in verse 26 a second illustration. This is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground, night and day, whether he sleeps or get up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself, the soil produces grain, first the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel. And then he says, as soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it, and because the harvest has come. The Word of God will produce a harvest. A part of the difficulty in our world today is we want to immediately go from planting to harvest. We want to shorten that growing season. We think, well, you know, I, I gave a Bible study last week and no one acted like anything happened. We immediately want to go from sowing the seed to harvest. It's pretty difficult because you and I live in a microwave, 24 hour a day, instantaneous world. Uh, as Mrs. Blake and I were living, the Reverend Mrs. Blake and I were living in quarantine, I thought I would be nice and do some of the grocery shopping. And you don't know what a sacrifice that is for me. Especially being masked up and gloved up and looking like I was in a store with a bunch of would-be robbers looking for a place to rob. And so I was trying to find my way through the Kroger. 
And I thought only in America did I see what I saw in the frozen aisle section. A milkshake that you microwave. Now friends, that doesn't even make sense that Americans are in such a hurry to have a milkshake, they're not even gonna let it thaw out, you put it in the microwave. I thought, therein I just discovered the problems of America. We can't even wait on a milkshake. And sometimes I'm wondering as churches if we don't give up too soon because we expect the harvest tomorrow. You have to sow the word. There's a cultivation. The soil is going to do it. Do the work as the word is implanted. And then Jesus said again in verse 30. What shall we say the kingdom of God is like? Or what parable shall we use to describe it? It is like a mustard seed which is the smallest seed you plant in the ground. Yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all the garden plants, with such big branches that the birds of the air can perch in its shade. The seed of the gospel to the naked eye seems like a rather small thing. You and I live in a world that loves big things. Large, enormous, gigantic, extra large, supersized. And we kind of despise the small things. But the gospel has always had its roots in smallness. It was 12 disciples and then minus one that Jesus gave the most audacious speech probably ever delivered on planet Earth. Go into all the world and preach the gospel, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you, and lo, I am with you to the end of the age. Now that is a tall order for such a small group. Yet today, well in excess of a billion people on this planet say they follow that Savior. Oh, don't, don't despise the day of small things. The gospel always starts out small. He says it's like, what, what is this word like? It is like the smallest seed you can imagine, but out of that smallest seed, comes a large plant. In 1918, I think I said this last week, so I'll pass by the joke. I mean, Kentuckians get all after me. My family had immigrated to the United States from Kentucky. And part of them went to, up into Northern Ohio. They, they had no church affiliation, which was rather peculiar in the early parts of the 20th century of the United States. But a pastoral couple, both ordained, man and woman, 1918, pitched a tent on the outskirts of Pauling, Ohio. And my great-grandmother's two sisters and their families were converted in that tent meeting, and they sicked the woman preacher on my widowed great-grandmother, who the first time, when she then came to church the next Sunday, the first time she heard the gospel message, stepped out from the back and came forward to an altar and gave her heart and life to Jesus Christ. Any of you ever been to Pauling, Ohio? There's usually one or two in every crowd for a little time. It's even smaller than Newcastle, Indiana. And that same couple that started that church, when they got it up and running, took their tent and went west to another little town, Huntington, Indiana, and started a Nazarene church there. Fifty years later, they, just, they stayed there and pastored for 19 years. Fifty years after they retired, I became the pastor in Huntington, Indiana from the people 
who led my great grandmother to the Lord in a little tent in a little town that I've never lived in. What started out small, that little seed they sowed 102 years ago, has been lived out in my life as I have preached the gospel these 39 years. Oh, don't despise small things. The word of God is a small thing, but when it takes root in a life, in a community, God will use it all out of proportion. But I can tell even behind your masks, some of you are skeptical. So let's go on. Now I want you to look at verse 35. Jesus has given these sermons, these teachings, and in parables. And then there are two words that if it's not sacrilegious to you, I'd like you to circle it in your Bible or make note. They don't sound particularly spiritual, but it is. Verse 35 in the New International Version has these two words. That day, not the next day, not the next week, but that day that Jesus said, the word of God is the seed. And when it is sown, there will come someday a harvest beyond the size of that seed. Because that's how the Word of God operates. That day. Have you ever had a that day with Jesus? Oh, I mean things are going good. They're, they're in their community where there's a synagogue on every corner. They've heard this spellbinding preacher, the Son of God. They've heard these marvelous parables and he has taken time out to even explain it to them, the importance of the Word of God being sown. And it says, that day, when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Jesus is not going to leave us like he finds us. And on that day, he said, let's go over to the other side. Well, the other side we're going to discover is the Decapolis, and Deca means 10, 10 cities. Well, there are Jewish folks interspersed, but there are, there are Greeks and there are Romans. And let's use a 21st century word. It's very secular. Everybody doesn't believe like the disciples believe. Everyone doesn't come from the same background that Jesus and the disciples. And he says, let's, let's go on over to the other side. You see, Jesus wants everyone to hear the word. And so he says to them that this powerful, important word of God, we can't just stay here. We have to go do some sowing, friends. And so that day, they got, I want you to notice what verse 36 said, they, they have to leave the crowd behind. That's the Bible way of saying they're leaving their friends behind. They're leaving the familiar behind. They're, they're leaving the things they've grown accustomed to and, and uh, used to. Jesus says, if you're going to follow me, you're going to have to follow me. And there are times that's going to mean leaving the crowd for a while. That, that, that may even mean that we, we have to go and put ourselves in some uncomfortable positions. And he took them along just as he was in the boat. And there were other boats with him. Now, notice that it does not say to us it was the disciples' idea to get in the boat and take a road trip. Or I guess a, a lake trip. Wasn't their idea. It was Jesus' idea. Because sometimes we have this idea that we, we, we only face problems when we get outside of God's will and we make rash decisions ourselves. Well, I, I'm not disputing that, but what I'm saying is if you think that it is a rose-strewn picnic following the Lord every day of your life, I, I have news for you. There are going to be some storms along the way. I can tell you're really excited about that. 
If you follow Jesus, you can expect there are going to be storms. Well, I did, again, I, 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 I see you're skeptical, so let's go on. It says a furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. The word there for squall is talking about rain that is almost horizontal and a fierce wind so fierce that it could tear the boat apart and they're being swamped to the point that they didn't think they were going to make it. Now, I, uh, I started working on this as I was reading through the Bible this year. When I came to this, I, I began to see some things in Mark 4, 5, 6, and 7, though I've read it for decades, that I hadn't really quite noticed before. So I, I began working on this a couple of months ago. <coughs> Long before I knew where I'd be today or where we'd be today when we, uh, when we are where we are right now. Friends, we're in the midst of a squall. Coronavirus, racism, fighting, looting. It, it's a squall. It, it's a storm. What do you do when the winds are troubling and you feel like the little boat of your life is nearly swamped? Well, they remember something that we ought to remember. Hey, wait a minute. Isn't Jesus on this boat somewhere? I mean, they were so focused on the storm and so focused on the rain and so focused on the wind and so focused on the fact they were going down they go, wait a minute. Jesus got us on this boat. He's here somewhere. And, and where's Jesus? Where's Jesus? He was in the stern, verse 38. Depending on your translation, sleeping on a cushion or a pillow. Isn't that amazing? You all remember when you were in... If you were in Sunday school, we didn't have children's church when I was young, but if you were in Sunday school, we used to sing about you could have peace in the storm if Jesus was on the boat with you. I mean, Jesus is sleeping through the storm. And they asked that question, teacher, don't you care that we're going to drown? Now, on a Sunday morning with this Augusta group, as I have gathered here with me today, we can all pretend like we are so entirely sanctified that we would never in our lives ask Jesus a question like that. Jesus, don't you care that we're going to drown? Let's have a real honest moment. I've asked Jesus that question about my life on several occasions. Jesus, don't you care what happens to me? Jesus, you know, I gave my heart and life to you way back there as a boy in 1969. Are you still there? You're the one that called me to preach. You're the one that got me on this boat. Jesus, don't you care that we're going to die? Jesus gets up. Verse 39, rebuked the wind and said, Quiet. Be still. The wind died down and it was completely calm. When Jesus is on the boat, the storms don't determine how long they're going to stay. Jesus determines how long they're going to stay. Now, somewhere back there, I know they preached it straight, but I heard it crooked. I thought if you became a Christian, everybody was going to love you. You'd have no cavities and smart children and a good job. And you just sort of float till you get to heaven. I, I just sort of thought that. Evidently, I'd skipped over Mark 4. <laughs> but you can come out of a revival meeting and go right straight into a storm. So the question this morning is that are we facing storms or are we going to face storms? That's a given. 
Where is Jesus? In the middle of our storms. Here's the good news. He's right there with us. Sometimes he'll tell the storms, peace be still, be quiet. Sometimes he just holds our hands and walks us through the storm. But remember, he said we, we've got to go to the other side. And then Jesus says, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? Do you realize how many times the Bible says, do not be afraid? Do not be afraid. You know why that's in there so often? Because you and I are afraid. Now, when I was a young preacher, I'd say, how many of you here today are afraid of something? And all the ladies would raise their hands. And the men would. So I stopped asking that because then I had to give a altar call for people who don't tell the truth, which was the minute. <laughs> Everybody's afraid of something. I used to be afraid of what people thought. Until one day it dawned on me, most of them don't. <laughs> and the ones who do aren't thinking about me. All of us are afraid of something. But Jesus says, it's not a fear issue, it's a faith issue. I promise to see you through. And they were terrified and they asked each other, who is this that even the winds and the waves obey him? Well, you know, as the chapter and verse divisions were put in the Bible over the years, it really breaks a good train of thought right here. Because you have to kind of read chapter five and chapter four. Because that's when they get to the other side. That's when they get to the destination where Jesus said, why we have to go? To the land where there is a synagogue on every corner. And when they they crossed the lake to the region of the Gerasenes, and when Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an evil spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs, and no one could find him anymore, not even with a chain. For he'd often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. Jesus goes to the other side from the prayer meeting, the revival service, from the familiar, from the comfortable for the disciples. And the first person they meet is a man demon-possessed who lives among tombs, among death. And we'll see in a moment, the countrymen in that area were more comfortable with death and destruction than they were transformation. But if you want to see a picture of the world in which you and I are living, you look at Mark chapter 5. Death, destruction, oppression, it's all right there. But notice, Jesus didn't go around it. He didn't ignore it. He went right into the middle of it. Because that's where Jesus always is. And when he saw Jesus, verse 6, from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of God most high? For Jesus said to him, Come out of this man, you evil spirit. Jesus asked, What's your name? The demon answered, My name is Legion, for we are many. He cast them out, and you know the story. They go into a large herd of pigs that were feeding nearby. Those tending the pigs, this is how you know, I can say, this is Bible study 101. This is how you know they were not in a predominantly Jewish area. There would not be pigs being herded. This is an area with a lot of Roman influence. Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this to the town and countryside. 
And the people went out to see what had happened. And when they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there dressed and in his right mind. Now you have the picture. No one could contain him. There was no chain strong enough that under the demonic influence he couldn't tear them apart. And he took stones, it says, and cut his flesh and he wouldn't wear clothes. And he was just totally out of control. But he meets the word of God. And notice when they came back from town, he was dressed and in his right mind. And wouldn't you think they would say to Jesus, we have had trouble with this guy for years. And about all of the places you could have gone, you came here. Thank you, Jesus. We're going to name a street after you. We're going to give you the key to the city because you have set this man free and we have seen a miracle. But that's not what happens because if you were following along in your Bibles, you'll know that I didn't read the entire verse to they found the man clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Another picture of our culture. We have gotten so comfortable as a culture with death and destruction and oppression that transformation seems scarier. A man who was naked, out of control, out of his mind, they're now terrified that he's fully clothed and in his right mind. You and I have to come to some acceptance of something. The gospel is counter culture. The gospel of Jesus Christ cuts against the grain. People get used to living without it. They aren't quite sure what to make of it. But here is a transformation. Remember, Jesus said, the seed is the word. And the farmer sows the word and some will receive it. And some may give the appearance or receive it for a while, but it doesn't take a root. Take root. And there are others that the troubles and the worries of life will, will choke off their spiritual life. But here's a man who is transformed, utterly changed, not reformed, not trying harder, not working on his to-do list, but a man who is utterly transformed by the power of God. Well, Jesus realizes it, it's time to go. And uh, in verse 16, the people began to plead with Jesus, leave our region. We, 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 we just can't handle you, Jesus. Oftentimes as a pastor, I've, I've heard people say, if we just give people Jesus, it won't be controversial. Jesus Christ is the most controversial person who has ever lived. Jesus, we, we have this idea because we have these paintings in our mind of the meek and lowly Jesus. And we have this idea that everyone loves Jesus. Jesus said, when I come, there will be division, even amongst households, amongst nations. And they said, oh, Jesus, please, we, we need things to get back to normal, death and destruction and oppression. Why, why don't you leave our town and leave things alone and leave things like they were? Well, Jesus left. One convert on that trip. One convert. I don't know what your definition of small is, but surely even the most generous of us think one is mighty small. I mean, they got in a boat, traveled across the sea, nearly lost everything, and one demon-possessed man 
is utterly transformed and the people say, go home. That, that's a, that seems to be a small result. Which one? Jeez, my phone is talking to me. I think she <laughs> says it's time to be quiet. I don't see the problem. <laughs> okay, honey, you can be quiet now, whoever you are. <laughs> Jesus says this in verse 19. He wouldn't let him go with him. And I can see why he'd want to go with Jesus. He owed everything to him. And, and Jesus said, go home to your family and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. Jesus says the best witness is not someone who's gone to seminary. No, there's nothing wrong with that. It's not even one who is studying how to be a witness. The best witness is the one who can say, let me tell you what my life used to be like. But then one day, I met Jesus. And I was dead and I've been made alive. Amen. I was lost and am now found. I was blind and can now see. No more powerful tool than a testimony. And that's all Jesus said to him. He didn't say he had to preach three pointed sermons. He didn't say you have to go by PowerPoint. He just said, go and tell your friends and family what the Lord has done for you. I'm wondering if we wouldn't see something happen in our world if we all just began to tell our transformation stories. What Jesus has done, and Jesus said, you so he went away, the man went away, and began to tell in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And all the people were amazed. I mean, it's a powerful thing, the transformation story. I mean, you don't even have to have a crime of Christ story. You could have been converted as a child. It's still a miracle when anyone comes to the Lord. It's a transformation story. The old passed away and all things became new. And people may be able to deny a lot of things, but someone can't deny what happened to you and what happened in you. You know, I've read that, like I said, for decades. And, and it, it wasn't until a little while ago when I saw it and uh, began wondering about it. And I want you to go to the seventh chapter. I've looked this up, so now we're talking somewhere six to eight months after the event that I just read to you, of the demoniac from the tombs. Six to eight months after Jesus said, no, son, you can't go with us. Can't everybody be a preacher? Somebody's got to be a witness. Go tell your friends and family what the Lord has done for you. Six to eight months. So again, Jesus is leaving where he is and he's going, he's on the move. And I, verse 31 of chapter 7. Then Jesus left the vicinity of Tyre and went through Sidon down to the Sea of Galilee and into the region of the Decapolis. These 10 cities, fairly secular, where Jesus said, go tell your friends and family. Six to eight months ago. Then, verse 32, there some people brought to him a man who was deaf and could hardly talk. And they begged him, being Jesus, to place his hand on the man. Now, there are no doubt two things that have happened in six to eight months. The fame of Jesus has swept the world. And a formerly demon-possessed man has told his story of transformation so that the first person Jesus meets as he re-enters the Decapolis is some friends who say we have a friend who needs you to touch him and heal now how did they know Jesus was able to do that no doubt his fame was spreading I give you that 
But there's also a man on loose in that town who used to live among the tombs, out of control, but who met Jesus and became fully clothed and in his right mind and had a story to tell. Jesus touches the deaf man. But what I want you, where I'm going to end is toward the end of that chapter. There is a crowd that's gathered to hear Jesus preach. In the region that six to eight months before they said, please get out of here. You've killed our hogs. You've set this crazy man free, this demon-possessed man free. We, we can't take this excitement. We need things to get back to normal. Get out of our town. Leave us. Jesus said to this man, just go tell your story. And it's the story where Jesus has been preaching in a crowd of over 4,000 gathered. And there are seven loaves of bread. And Jesus again multiplies the loaves and fish and fed a few thousand people. Six to eight months later, for when it might have looked like his preaching trip didn't amount to that much, for just one demon possessed man had an encounter with the living Christ. And six to eight months later, several thousand say, we want to hear what Jesus has to say. Maybe if he could help a guy like that, just maybe he can do something for me. Jesus said, what shall I compare the kingdom of God to? It is like a mustard seed, the smallest of all the seeds. And yet when it is planted, it becomes the largest of those vegetation. So large that even birds can come and make nests in its branches. Jesus said, is the word of God. And when it's sown, we will all be amazed at the harvest that it brings. All right, Brother Blake, so what? A lot of people, if they walked in the back and looked at us today, would shake their heads and laugh. What in the world is that for the crowd ever? What, 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 what can happen with that few, few people? And I believe the Lord wants me to say to you, it's not our size, it's the size of our God. And are we willing, church, to continue to sow the Word of God in Newcastle, Henry County, and beyond? Way back there, when someone had a dream that there ought to be a church in Newcastle, Indiana. And I'm sure they had to sacrifice. And I'm sure folks made fun of them. And I'm sure it was hard. But today, we're enjoying the harvest because some folks back there thought it was worth it to sow the Word of God. Would you bow your heads with me?